That's better. All right. Welcome back. Sorry we're off to a little bit of a late start. Thanks for everybody making out here on a brisk day. Today, I don't have much of a plan. My plan, my goal, my aim, my most fervent desire of my heart on Valentine's Day is to prepare you for next week's mentor. That's my goal. I will take questions today. We will go over some problems together, um, look at some examples of how to do some of the recent homework problems. Uh, but again, this is really your class. Um, we, there is no new content today. We have talked about everything you guys need to succeed next week. Any questions before we get started? Again, I'm happy to look at homework problems together, happy to talk about any concepts that might still be a little bit slippery. Um, yeah. Yeah, we will. That one's actually, I'm actually prepared for that one. Yeah, that one's up here. Yeah. String rotation, always a classic. We'll look at it. Yeah, in the back. What was that? Uh, checking the board? That's also on here. Yeah, we will. Yep, okay. Well, so far I'm two for two. Who thinks they can stump me? So far I have masterfully anticipated your every need. But I'm, I'm out of, yeah. Uh, the question about trim and split, yeah, we could do that one. There's a, another question. I couldn't hear the question. Oh, yeah, that's not used, but that's how long the exam is. Yeah. All right, so let me uh, talk a little bit about um, the midterm first. So look, you guys have done a lot over the past four weeks, and I think you guys should take a minute. Um, you know, I've talked about this before, but I want to say it again. As a computer scientist, as a software developer, you are going to encounter failure and frustration on a daily basis, on a daily hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute basis. And so one of the things that's important for your psychological health is to look back from time to time and actually be able to feel good about things, right? I know that like the, the class just is sort of relentless when it comes to these homework problems. Like every day there's a new homework problem. I just did the one yesterday and now there's a new one I can't do. But you guys are doing the homework problems. I mean, when I look at the homework, number of people that are completing the homework problems, that's 90 to 95% per night, okay? So the people in this room, if you look back over the last four weeks, you have a lot more successes to celebrate than failures. But a lot of times, again, and I'm guilty of this myself, and I know that, and I've been learning recently to practice a little bit more self-care, is that it's always on to the next thing. You know, as soon as you fix that bug, then it's on to solving the next one. And sometimes we don't take a minute to stop, take a breath, smile, feel good about ourselves, feel like we're learning, look back at what we were capable of four weeks ago, look at what we're doing now, and just recognize that, you know, your brains are changing. You know, because of the practice you're getting, because of the time and energy and the work that you're putting into it. You know, the biggest, you know, the biggest driver of failure in this class is when people give up. That's it. You know, so the biggest question, you guys that make it to the end are going to do well. People that finish this class get really, really good grades. That's because anybody can learn this. It's just a question of staying the course, not giving up, not giving into despair, not getting too frustrated, Take a minute, look back. If you didn't get the homework problem today, remember, you did the one yesterday. By the way, there's no homework problem today, if you're confused. It can be a day off, uh, prepare for a little bit more preparation for the midterm, a chance to finish up at B0. Okay, the goal of the midterm that's coming up this next week is not to give you a grade. It's a diagnostic tool. This is a test suite that we're running on each one of you, and I want to make sure you're ready for what we're about to go ahead and do, right? That's the goal of this midterm and of the next midterm as well. But this midterm is before the drop deadline. It's pretty early in the course. This has, I think, more of a diagnostic function. 
So the goal is to make sure that you are ready to go on and succeed in this class. That's it, okay? It's not to assign you a grade. And we'll talk next week after the midterm about how to interpret your scores. Now, look, a lot of you are here because you're used to doing really good on things. A lot of you aren't gonna get every programming question on the midterm, that's okay. Um, uh, we'll talk about, again, how to interpret your midterm score next week. Um, but the goal of this exam that's worth less than most of the quizzes is just, it's a checkpoint in the semester so that we can make sure that you guys are working in a way that's gonna allow you to succeed for the rest of the semester. Right? I have very high confidence that the people here are gonna do quite well. But I just want you to understand why we're doing this. It's not punishment. It's not because we're angry. Um, it's not because we have to fill in a box at the end of the semester where we put a grade. It's because we want to know how you're doing and make sure that you're ready for what comes next. All right? Midterm format. All right? 12 multiple choice questions. There are no coders questions on the midterm. Um, these questions are, there are zero of the what is the type of this variable, you know, the, the lecture comprehension questions, there's none of those. These are a little bit more meaty code reading questions. Now, just to make you feel a little bit better, you have seen every one of these questions before. These are all pulled from previous um, quizzes. Okay, so these are not new. Shouldn't be any big surprises here. But these will ask you to look at a piece of code and answer questions like what is it gonna do or whatever. Um, okay. Three programming questions. One of them is gonna be on arrays. One of them will have you use a multidimensional array. And the third one is on strings. One of these questions is available to you on the one homework 125 practice problem set right now. It's one of the previous homework problems. I'm not gonna tell you which one, but it's there. Just this morning, I added yesterday's problem to the practice problem set. I also added the problems from the second two quizzes, quiz one and quiz two. Tomorrow, once I'm sure that everybody is done with quiz three, I'll, ask the, I'll, add, I'll add the programming problems from quiz three to the practice problem set as well. So you guys will have access to all the homework problems that you've completed, all of the programming questions from all the quizzes that you've completed, and in that set, somewhere, is one of the questions you will see on next week's midterm. So try and find it. Try every one of those problems multiple times. If you can do all these problems, you are ready. You will do well. All right, so you know what? I'm not gonna do this too easy. Um, let's, let's go to some of those questions people asked about. So there was a question on string rotation. All right, so let's do this guy. So this was, uh, we did a right rotation on the homework last week and then asked you to do a left rotation in the CBTF. And to be frank, you guys bombed this question, right? Um, this was not the one that people did the best on. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about how this works and then I'll show you some examples. Uh, we're actually gonna go through some examples of how to solve this problem that could be improved and then we'll work on them a little bit together and, and make them better. All right, so our goal here is to take a string and rotate it to the left. So hopefully we have a sense of what string rotation is. We talked about it. We gave you some examples on the homework. So, you know, CS125 rotated left. One character is S125C, okay? So what, someone walk me through the process of doing this. You guys did this on the homework. Talk me through an algorithm for approaching this problem. Like if you were, you know, and, and again, it's not a bad idea to think about, like if I gave you, if I wrote down a word on paper and I told you to shift it left by two characters, well, how you would do it, what you would, kind of, kind of what would happen, right? What would you think about? Someone walk me through an algorithm, not code. I don't want to hear about, I don't want to hear Java programming constructs. I want you to describe in words how you would solve this. All the way on the left. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna need two arrays. So that's a good starting point, right? I need one array that contains the original string and then I need another array to put stuff in. And to some degree, this question really just boils down to, for each index in the original array of characters, where should that character be copied to in the new array? Right, that's what I need to do. Yeah, over here. Yeah, 
Yeah, we have some, uh, we have some checks that we want to do as well. That's a great thing. So the first thing I might want to do in my function is check for uh, things like if the string is null, I can't do much with it, so I need to return uh, something that you know, indicates that I couldn't work with it. Uh, if it's empty, then I don't have any work to do. What's the other case where I don't have any work to do? There's an, yeah. Okay, so if the shift is zero, that's true. One other case, yeah. String is empty, one other case, yeah. Yeah, we'll get that, that one, that's too complicated. It's a simpler case. There's one that's already done for you, yeah. Huh? Keep, keep going. A length of one, right? Because a, a string of length one shifted any number of characters, just the same string, right? Just that one character keeps looping around. You know where it's gonna go, right? All right, so I have some corner cases I can handle, you know, failure cases that I need to think about. Okay, so let's say I have a string that I actually need to do some work on. So I have this two array approach. Um, let's see. So I'm gonna create this new character array at the same size as the input. And then one character at a time, I need to take characters out of that original string. And there I can go in any order. But I'm just gonna go in order from front to back. Because that's how I like to loop through arrays. And for each character, I know that the string that I get out is gonna be the same length. So every character in the original string has to go somewhere. And this whole problem really just boils down to figuring out where should it go. All right, and that's how we're gonna, that's how we're gonna uh, approach it. Once I know where it goes, I can figure out how to do this copy. But really the work that I'm doing inside this loop is figuring out what's the right place for it. All right, so let's write this function together. So first of all, let's set up our function definition. I'm gonna put this up top. We'll say this is gonna return a string. It's gonna take a string as input. And for now, just to get this to compile, um, why is it angry with me? Oh, right. Oh, it needs to take two, <laughs> sorry, it needs to take two arguments. So, input and rotation, right? And this is my other problem, I apologize. Okay, so now here's my method call to rotate left. There were some mismatched parentheses in my original example. Um, my rotate left function takes two arguments, the string to rotate and how far, right? And so first let's do, let's, let's handle those, uh, those problematic cases. Okay. So what was one of them? What's one that's really a problem that could produce a pretty serious crash if I'm not careful about it? No. But I have to handle the case if input is null. So if input is equal to null, here I'm just gonna return null. You know, there's no way to rotate null, okay? So that's good. There were some other cases that I could kind of cheat and not do any work. What were those? So if input is null, yeah, in the back. Yeah, I'm, see, I'm not even gonna worry about that one. That one's too clever. Simpler ones. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, the rotation is zero. So I'll say if rotation is equal to zero, what are some other cases where I don't have to do any work? Yeah. What's that? No, I don't even have a modulus here yet, right? I just have this rotation. So if I don't need to rotate the string at all, or the length is one, or, yeah, the string's empty, length is zero. So I'll say if rotation is zero, or input.length is less than or equal to one, I'm just gonna return the original input because I don't have any work to do. Now, let me ask you a question. Could I do it this way? Does this also work? If no, why not? What's the problem with this? This is handling the same cases, right? Just put them in a different order, but why, why won't this, why isn't this not correct? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if I pass null, what's gonna happen here is that this is going to crash. So let's pass null. Oh. Yes, I got bitten by the same bug you guys did. Um, oh, sorry, I passed zero as the rotation. There we go. Right, so now I have a, I have a, this is a runtime error. Why? Because rotation isn't equal to zero, and so I go and I try to evaluate the right side of that or statement, and I've got a null, that input is null. So input.length is going to blow up. So frequently, whenever you're checking for null, that has to be the first thing you do in the function. Now, one of the things you'll notice about this particular style of doing things is that I check for something that I can't handle, and if I, if I don't need to do any more work, I return immediately, right? Some of you I've seen doing things like this, right? And then I write some code in here. The problem with that is that by the time you're done, so if I can say if, if rotation is greater than zero, if input.length is greater than one, right? So now the code that's actually doing the work is like way inside this nested block, right? This will work and I can write this correctly using this style, but I don't, I don't prefer it. I prefer to do things this way where I check for a case I can't handle and then I return something. So in this case, if input is null, I cannot go any farther in the, in, the, in the function. I have to return immediately. I can't check the length, can't do, I can't call caret, which I'm gonna need to call in a minute. I can't do anything with the string. Now, if I get to line five, what do I know about input? Whenever my program reaches line five in this example, what do I know about input? It is not null. Because if it was null, I would never reach line five. I would have returned on line three. So now I get to line five, and what do I know about input? I know that it's not null. So I know that on the right side of that or statement, I can call input.length. When I get down to line eight, what do I know about input? What do I know about my inputs once I reach line eight? The length is either two or more, and rotation is non-zero. So in this case, I have some work that I need to do. All right, so we've handled, our, we've handled our problematic inputs. Now let's write kind of the main body of this function. So what is the, what is the main sort of uh, control flow structure that I need to use here? Someone get me started. Okay, so I, I, yeah, let's, well, let's make the, let's make the new array. That's a good point. Okay, so uh, how do I convert a string to an array? Anybody remember? If you guys forget, did I have, do I have the documentation here? Nope, I don't. So I can say care, I'm gonna call this input array is equal to input dot two care array. What else do I need? This is where the original characters in the string are now stored, is into this array. What's the other thing that I need? Yeah. I need an output array. How big should that be? Same size. Care, sorry, new care input array dot length. Whenever we are working on something like this, always useful to test things just to make sure they're compiling and nothing is crashing, so this is fine. I haven't done any work yet, but all my array declarations are sane and stuff like that. Okay. Now what? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great question. So the midterm includes string documentation. If there's any other Java documentation you guys want on the midterm, I'm happy to add it. Just mention it on the forum and I'll put it on. Right now, I think it's like string and maybe array, and, but I, I don't care. I'll put, I mean, I'm not gonna put the entire Java website in there, right? Uh, but if you guys have specific pieces of uh, documentation you're finding helpful, I'm happy to put Other than a page that contains answers to the homework problems, also not gonna be on. All right, so now what do I do? Let's just, again, let's work piece by piece here. 
We're not going to try to solve the whole problem. Let's just get started. What do I, so I've got these two arrays. I've got the array that stores my input characters, the array that stores my output characters. What do I need to do now? What's the next sort of control structure that I need? Yeah. Yeah, I need to go through my input array one character at a time. And to do that, I'm going to use a for loop. I want that canonical for loop that we've written, you guys have started to write multiple times. I'm going through input array dot length. And let's just print the index. Okay. Good. So I see that I have five indices, zero through four, which makes sense because the length of my string is five. All right? I could also print both the index and the character at that position. And this is looking right. So it's looking like I'm going through my input array one character at a time. All right. So now a useful thing to do when you're working on a problem like this is picking, let's pick one input. I'm going to pick this string and rotate left one. And let's handle it. Let's figure out how to handle it. So at this point, in, inside my loop, I know the index of the character in my original string. What do I need to compute? Right, so now I've got an output array that's ready to receive characters. I've got an input array that I'm iterating through. I just need one more piece of information. So I know where I'm taking the character from. I need to know what. Yeah, exactly. I need to know where it's going. So I know where it's from, I need to know where it's going. So let's, I'm going to create a new, or let's call, the, let's call this output index. All right? So now, and now let's print the, the two together. Now this is clearly not correct. If I did this, I'm just copying the original string. But I know that I need to do some type of transformation. There's some mathematical transformation I need to perform on that variable i in order to get my output index. Okay? So who can get me started? Right, it's not going to finish the job. But let's think about it. So let's think about the last character, because we're shifting to the left. So the character with index four in the original string, where should that go in the new string? So the five, right? In my new string, what index is that character at? I'm shifting left by one. So it started off on index four, and it's going to index three. What about the character two? It started off on index three, it's going to index. Okay, so what does it seem like I'm doing here? Subtracting, how many? Rotation. Ooh. So let's try i minus rotation. I'm shifting to the left. It seems like it makes sense, okay. All right, so I'm close. The last character is correct. The second to last character is correct. All these are correct except which one? So which character is not, so this is the index in the original string, this is where I'm going to try to put it. Which character is not ending up in the right place? It's the first one, right? Negative one is not a valid index. Where should this one go? It should go where? It should go to four, okay? All right. So. Who, want, who thinks they have an idea for how to, how to fix this? Who wants to try something? Yeah. Okay, okay, so that's interesting. Let's try this. So we'll say if output 
index is less than zero, then you're gonna say this. What? Is that what we wanna try? Okay. So that works. All right? Or does it? Yeah. Well, hold on a sec. Let's, let's try this first. Okay, so this seems to work, except what if I try this input? So this is now trying to shift two to the left, right? And so now what happened? Now again, if I start at the end of the string, this one's right, this one's right, this one's right, these two are wrong. And they're both ending up in the same position. So this, this approach of checking whether or not it's less than zero and then assign it to four only worked in that one case where I was shifting one. So let's not do that. Who else has another idea? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, can we use the Java's remainder operator? All right? Um, and the, so normally, let me, let me preface this by saying, if you have, for, are you familiar with a language that has a real modulus operator? Normally, the modulus of negative, negative one modulus five is normally four. So that would normally be correct. But let's see what happens in Java. So we're gonna subtract the rotation. And then, what am I gonna use as my modulus? The length of what? Of the array. So I'm trying to bring this back within the length of the array. Okay? Hmm. Doesn't seem to have helped. Now, this, this did help in certain cases. Let me try a, let's try a larger shift, like six. Okay? So now I see at least they're all between zero and negative five, right? What if I, I do something like 11? Same thing. All right, so, the problem in Java is that the modulus operator does not function like a modulus operator. It functions like a remainder. So if you give it a negative result, it gives you a negative answer. So what do we need to do here? It's a very simple fix that we need to apply. Yeah, way over in the back. Yeah, so now, here's what we're gonna do. This is similar to what somebody suggested a minute ago. If output index is less than zero, I'm gonna add the length of the array. So this is gonna move negative one back into a valid index for an array of length five, which is zero through four. All right, so let's try that. Now I see I have the correct answer for one. Okay, yeah. Let's try it. Yeah, so the great, this is a great question. That's exactly what I wanted to do next. Let's try a different test case, okay? So with, with rotation, we know that if I add a rotation of five more, I should end up with the same answer, correct? Yeah, because this string is length five, okay? So now let's see what happens. Let's try six. Ooh. Good, what's another one to try? Add five, let's try 11. These should all be the same because they're all, they're just looping around, okay? 11 looks correct, let's try 16. We could do this all day, also correct, yeah. Yeah, so this, this is looking promising. Somebody give me another input to try. We've been, we've been essentially trying a string rotation of one to see if we can get that to work first. Somebody give me something else to try here. How about two? We're picking inputs where we know what the answer should be. And then we're checking it. And look, we haven't even, we're not even creating a new string. We're just making sure the indices look correct. So again, the last one ends up at position two. These all look correct. The first character in the string is now the second to last character. All right, so now we're feeling good about this. 
let's actually put things back together. The last thing I need to do, so now I'm getting to line 15. What's the last bit? Well, there's two last things I need to do here. What's the last thing I need to do to finish this up? Or at least to get to the point where we can keep testing it, but actually see what the real output is. Got one last step here. Not, not hard, I know you guys know the answer. Don't make me stand here all awkward and stuff, just tell me. Yeah. So that's the last, last thing we have to do, right? But right now, I don't even, I haven't even copied anything into that character right. So what do I need to do before I can Put them in the output array. Yeah. So I know where to put them. So now line 15 is copying characters from my input array into my output array. Those two positions might be different. They might be the same depending on what the shift is, but this will handle all the cases I need. So I know where to put it in the output, and I know where it's coming from. Now, very last step is to return, and we showed you how to do this on the homework problem, I return a new string that I create by using that output array. So this takes the output array of characters that I've created and converts it back into a string, which is returned by the function. All right, so let's see if this is correct. That looks right. Let's try something like seven. That looks right. Let's try zero to make sure I can handle the simple cases. Let's try five. Let's try 10. Yeah. So anything that's multiple of five is going to result in the same string. Let's try some of those corner cases we looked at before. Let's make sure I can handle the empty string, a string with one character, a string with two characters, give it something odd, and you should see it swapped. Yeah. All right, questions about this? You know, the, you know, my goal here is not to arrive at this answer. My goal here is to show you a little bit about the process. Because look, by the time you're done with this, it's like, oh my gosh, it looks a little frightening, right? Um, but getting there step by step, piece by piece, you know, line by line. You don't just sit down and try to write this all in one swoop. You work your way up to it. You do a little bit. Test it, see if it does anything, right? And add a little bit more, add a little bit more, right? Until we arrive at the final result. Again, like I said before, this is frustrating. If you build in, every time when we were doing this, I ran that and I saw that it compiled and ran and produced some type of output, I felt a little better about myself. I was like, okay, I haven't made some terrible error that I you know, need to fix. So you build this up step by step and you, you earn these little points of validation along the way. Questions about this? Yeah, back. How do I rotate right? Okay. So it turns out there's a very, we've already finished right rotation. We just did it. Anybody wanna tell me how to rotate right? Yeah. Oh no, it's even, even easier than that, yeah. Tell me how to rotate. I can write rotate right in one line, yeah. Oh, no, it's even simpler than that, yeah. There you go. What is a left shift? It's a negative right shift. What's a right shift? It's a negative left shift. So let's try this again, CS125. I want to rotate right by one character. There it is. Now, when you guys did rotate right on the homework, it wouldn't have worked as rotate left because you didn't handle the case where it went negative. But because we handle that case, this function does all the work for both rotate right and rotate left. And so if we wanted to be clever here, I'm going to create a new function called rotate right takes a string as input, and an int as rotation, and I will return 
rotate left, input negative one times rotation. And this is now my implementation, if I can remember to put, of rotate right. There it is. Yeah, so you, so, I mean, you guys did the, the, those of you that did the encryption lab, I hope, saw the same thing. Right? Decrypt is just encrypt with the different, like flipping one of the arguments. Same thing here. Rotate right is just a negative left rotation. All right, so now I've done both without writing a single extra line of code. All right, let me look at, somebody wanted to do a, the, a problem using, um, I'm not gonna do this. Someone wanted to use split. So let's, let's look at how split works. Just gotta remind myself. Let's, there, was a, there was a problem on phone numbers. We can do that one. So the problem was something like, if I give you a phone number like, It's equal to, let's say that I give you this phone number, and I want you to reformat it into parentheses, one, two, three, four, space, five, four, five, sorry, one, two, three, one, four, the. I want it to look like this. Now there were a couple of different ways to do this. One of them was to use substring, right? Because I know, yeah. Oh, I'm on the next, I'm on the slide after the, the long example. Rotate left, right here. Thanks for asking. Okay. So this is what I wanna do. But there's another way to do this using, using split. So let's, let's, uh, hold on. I wish I had the string um, documentation in front of me, but here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna say parts is equal to phone number dot split, and let's try passing this character, and then I'm gonna print how many parts I got. Okay, okay, so that's, it's not very promising. Anyone know what I'm doing wrong? Let me try it, let me try this slightly, slightly differently, right? Let's imagine that we had a phone number like this. Now, let's see what happens. Okay. So now, when I split, I'm getting an array back that has three elements. I'll explain why the first one didn't work in a second. But let's look at what's in this array. So let's print parts zero. Let's also print parts one and then let's print parts two. So the split function takes a character, and every time it sees that character in the string, it creates a new substring. And so what you get out of split is an array of strings that contains all the parts from the original string that were separated by whatever character you use. Okay, so we're close now. If I wanted to actually print the phone number in the new format, I would have to do something like this. I'm gonna string new format is equal to parts zero, sorry. So this is the first part of the plus parts one plus parts two. And let's see if that's correct. That looks right. And this is very, very common when you're doing any sort of string process. Right? I'm taking a string, splitting it in some way, and then I'm doing some processing on the output, okay? What if I wanted to add, let's say for some reason, I wanted to add one to the first part of the phone number, right? So I wanted to add one to the one, two, three, and end up with one, two, four. So what I wanna do is to say part zero plus one Hmm, what just happened? So this worked, what's the problem here? I wanted one, two, four, and instead I got one, two, three, one, why?
because these are strings. So when I add something to them, what is the add on, what is the plus operator doing? It's concatenating. So if I want to get an int out of this string, there's a function called integer.parse int, and I can pass it a string. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Good. And now I can say first part. Now this looks the same, but I can also say first part plus one, and I end up with one, two, four, because now I'm interpreting that as an integer rather than a string. This is not, this way of converting from a string into an integer is not something that we would expect you to know on a quiz unless we told you about it in the write-up. But it does exist and allows you to take something that started as a string and convert it to a numerical form. Now, obviously, this doesn't always work. So, for example, if I had, right, blah, then I get, this causes an error. Because Java says, look, you gave me the string blah, I don't know how to convert that to a number. This would also, I'd also have the same problem if I had a string like one, two, three, right? This can't be converted to an integer. It has a decimal component. But anything that can be interpreted as an integer can be converted into it this way. Okay, that was the split example. I'm out of time, so I'm not going to be able to do the, the tic-tac-toe one, but I'm pretty sure if you guys look at the video from last semester or last year, we did do the tic-tac-toe example. So that's, that's online. All right. Any last questions? Good luck finishing up MP0. You guys are almost there. Like I promised, this is good preparation for the midterm. Um, on Monday, we move into the object orientation portion of the class. Um, you guys have a midterm next week. I wish you the best of luck preparing. Stay warm this weekend. Come to office hours to finish up. I will see you on Monday.